or into the 20th century when you have critics like I.A. Richards, when you have critics like T.S. Eliot. Remember, each age has its own concept of criticism. Dr. Johnson was very clear that criticism is basically divisible into two parts. What is fundamental and indispensable and what is accidental or prescribed by custom. Let me repeat that. Some things are fundamental and indispensable. That means you must have that in order to consider something good criticism. You have a second part, something which could be accidental or because of time and custom, it has become sacrosanct. These prescriptions of authority keep changing with every age. But the first, the fundamental and indispensable, according to him, is always based on nature and reason. That brings us to the first point of Johnson as a critic, and that is the historical approach. In fact, Dr. Johnson has been called the true father of historical criticism in English. What does he mean by this? When you look at a critic, you have to remember that he is conditioned by his age and environment. When you look at a writer, that is when a critic looks at a writer, he should not judge the writer on the basis of the age in which the critic lives. For example, Dr. Johnson lived in the 18th century and he's talking about a writer who lived in the 16th century or in the 17th century. Should Dr. Johnson be judging Shakespeare and Milton, for example, by the standards of Dr. Johnson's age, that is the 18th century, the neoclassical age, or should he be judging Shakespeare by the age in which he wrote? Dr. Johnson is very, very clear on this point. He says, we must remember that every writer lives in a particular age and environment. And therefore, when he talks about Shakespeare, when he talks about the violence that Shakespeare showed on his stage, which the neoclassical writers and critics and people and reading public could not accept, Dr. Johnson says, let us go back to the Elizabethan age. Let us see under what circumstances for what audience Shakespeare wrote. And then we will realize that violence was essential in the tragedies or the historical plays of Shakespeare. He talks about Milton's Paradise Lost and he justifies many of the things which the 18th century critic found unacceptable. Dr. Johnson was very clear that unless you look at a writer about the age in which he lives, unless you link him with the age in which he lives, unless you are able to see the environment in which he wrote, you will not be able to really understand the greatness, to assess the real contribution of the writer. And therefore he says, to judge rightly of an author, we must transport ourselves to his time and examine what were the wants of his contemporaries and what were his means of supplying them. And this is what he does when he looks at Shakespeare and Milton, two great writers according to all of us and of course according to Dr. Johnson too. What does he say about poetry? He says, Poetry is the art of uniting pleasure with truth by calling imagination to the help of reason. Please remember, he is giving equal importance to imagination and to reason. Equal importance to imagination and to reason. That means, my dear students, to him, great poetry can be born only out of a proper combination of the head and the heart. The head and the heart. Remember, when we reach the Romantic Age, which we shall do soon after the Neoclassical Age, 
we think of imagination as being very important and therefore we think the head or reason has got nothing much to do. But Dr. Johnson was very clear that great poetry has to unite imagination as well as reason. And therefore he says, in the imitation of truth, it is guided by reason and in affording pleasure, it is by imagination. Truth to be poetic has to be pleasure giving. You remember an ode which was to be written much later by a very young poet who says truth is beauty, beauty, truth. And therefore truth to be poetic has to be pleasure giving is what Dr. Johnson says. What is good poetry? After we have defined poetry, what is good poetry? How do we test good poetry? How do we decide that some poetry is good and some is not? Here he talks about the importance of time. He says that only that poetry which pleases many and pleases long, pleases many and pleases long. He gives importance to the time. How long is a poet popular? How long is a poet read? If it pleases long, that is for a long period of time, then it is good poetry. But at the same time, Dr. Johnson is very clear that it should not appeal to only one class, to one age, to one group. It should please many. Many would mean all sections of society, different sections of society, People of different ages, by ages I, am, I mean age, that is the age that they are, not the age spelt with a capital A, because that would come under pleases long. It has to be able to speak a universal language, able to speak a universal language, because if it has to please many and if it has to please long, the language that is used should not be some kind of jargon. The language that is used should not be something that only one class can understand. You know, we use words like slang and jargon. You know what it means. Certain words in our language, any language, whether it's Hindi or Gujarati or English or any language in any part of the world, if it is used only by a particular group, only a particular group understands it. If it is relevant only to a particular profession, then we call it jargon. When we use the word slang, I'm sure you understand that this is not a language which is accepted in writing. It is not a language which is ac accepted in educated society, in polite society. Slang is okay for everyday colloquial conversation, but not for writing. And therefore, Dr. Johnson insists on poetry being able to speak a universal language, a language that can be understood by all. What about meter? Remember, the neoclassical age believed in rules. They believed in means and sometimes they thought that the end was not important. Dr. Johnson did not do that. To him, both the means and the end were equally important. And therefore, remember, he talked about pleasure. Pleasing is, after all, an end. In order to do that, what do you use? What is the means? The means is universal language. And another thing that he insists on is regular meters. Please look at the word. It's not matters. It's regular meters. The importance of regular meter. Not what the Romantic age was going to do, that meter was not important and therefore even great poets like Wordsworth had different meters in different poems. The importance of regular meters, I insist that you correct that, my dear students. Regular meters were important because he says only then will poetry really appeal. And in order to do this, he talks about the kind of language. Remember the figures of speech that you have heard about, you have read about, that you have seen in the poetry that you have read over the last two years, the last two and a half years maybe. 
What are the figures of speech that you know? Some of you might remember very difficult ones like synecdoche and metonymy and onomatopoeia and oxymoron. But when we think of figures of speech, when we think of alankar in any of our languages, the first two that come to our mind are the simile and the metaphor. Remember, even in our everyday language, we use so much, so many similes, so many metaphors. They've become so common that we refer to them as dead metaphors. They don't surprise us anymore. They don't please us anymore. As cold as ice, as hot as fire, as black as coal, as white as milk, all these are very, very common similes. But to Dr. Johnson, the similes were very important. He says that great poets, when you look at their writing, you will notice the greatest of poets have regular meters and then the use of similes is very good. He gives you examples from Dryden. He gives you examples from Milton to prove his point. And when he talks about these poets, he is also convinced that, he is convinced that the greatest form of poetry is the epic. No wonder there are so few epics in the world. Think of any language in the world, there might not be more than one or two epics. As is true of the English language, and you know that John Milton in the Puritan age wrote the first epic in the English language. Johnson has great praise for the epic as a literary genre. The two which he does not much care for, and in fact he is very critical of, are the pastoral and the Pindaric ode. My dear students, those of you who have heard of Lycidas, have read Lycidas, have studied it probably as part of your syllabus, might remember that Dr. Johnson was very critical of Lycidas. He thought it was artificial. He thought there was no true grief in it. And one of the reasons for that is he considered the pastoral and the Pindaric ode to be not very good as poetic forms. And therefore, his criticism of these forms. When I talk about the lives of poets a little later, we shall look at this criticism in greater detail. Next uh, slide, please. Then we move on to what he says about drama. He says, any good play has to be a faithful mirror of manners and life. Faithful mirror of manners and life. The writer lives in a particular period, in a particular age, in a particular environment. I'm repeating this point again and again, my dear students, because all Johnson's criticism has this as the basis. And therefore, when he talks about drama, he says that it has to be a faithful mirror of manners and life. Being a species of poetry, it should hold up, he says about drama, it should hold up a faithful mirror of manners and of life. It should present human sentiments in human language. A story in a play, according to him, is a picture either of an individual or of human nature in general. If it be false, it is a picture of nothing. A great play is not a story of a few men, but of men in all ages. Their actions, their thoughts, their passions is what they depict. All plays depict, all good plays depict. And that is why he says Shakespeare is great because of this reason. Let us look at the unities. Remember, you have studied Aristotle as a critic. You have heard about Aristotle and he knew, you do know that he talked about the three unities. Remember the three unities of time, place and action. According to Dr. Johnson, the other two, that is time and place are not very important. He believes in unity of action. 
He gives us various reasons for it. And if you look at some of his writings, maybe you will find it in detail. But at the moment, I just want to remind you about what is unity of action. That is, all the actions in a play should be one inseparable whole. That means the threads. Remember the Vidushak, what he is doing. He is holding the play together. Remember the chorus. They step in whenever you feel that the play is getting out of hand. He believes that all the action in any good play should become one inseparable whole. And therefore, he says that the unity of action is important. He argues why unity of place and unity of time are not important. Do we need to make play credible? Any play, any drama? He says, the necessity of observing the unities of time and place arises from the supposed necessity of making the drama credible. But Dr. Johnson believes that when you go to see a play, you know it's a play. You accept that it's a play. So if at one moment, if this could be Ahmedabad, Gandhinagar, and if the next scene takes you to Mumbai or Delhi, he says, why not? If in one scene you are in 2001, and in the next scene you are in 2005, Dr. Johnson says, so what? What's the problem? Because if you can imagine that you are in 2001, if you can imagine that you are in Ahmedabad, you can also imagine that you are in Mumbai and that you are in 2005. This is how he argues against the need for the unities of time and place. But when he comes to the unity of action, he says that we must, must have unity of action because otherwise the audience or the reader, depending on whether you're reading a play or seeing a play, you will not be able to appreciate it in its totality. When we go to watch a play, all of us know that it is imitation, imitation of life. I've already talked about poetry being a mirror to life, according to Dr. Johnson. And therefore, he says, natural human pleasure comes in imitation. Whenever we see a picture, he says, Dr. Johnson says, it is as good as seeing the original. We cannot see the original. So what is shown to us on the stage? What is presented by a dramatist? An imitation of the original. And the human mind is capable of appreciating the imitation.